afternoon, our spring lecture series visiting scholar is Yuri Millen, who's a professor of English at UCLA. And who am I? Well, many things, but <laughs> I'm Lisa B. Thompson, a professor, a professor of African and African diaspora studies. And I actually went to the school where he is um, a professor, which is kind of funny to think about that. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Yuri Millen is a cultural historian who researches and writes in the interstices between Black cultural studies, performance studies, queer theory, and contemporary art. I first met Yuri Millen at an ASA conference in San Antonio. The first thing that struck me about him, I already heard him do it, and his tutorial style. <laughs> I'm petty with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was intrigued even further. Um, and a few years later, my esteemed colleague, sister doctor, Omi Ashuna Joanne Jones, who it's her birthday today, by the way. Um, she's been co hosting with Toy de France, the Black Performance Theory Group here at UT Austin in April 2013. And an opportunity to get to know him better. Yuri and I collaborated on a piece um, with Stephanie Baptiste at UC Santa Barbara called Inheritance. They examined what we inherited from black women. As you composed that three-part performance piece, I first learned about Joyce E., a black woman who's, who was who was enslaved by P.T. Barnum in the 19th century as a nursemaid and presented as uh, the, the and, and presented as a nursemaid to George Washington. This would become the subject of the first chapter of his brilliant of Yuri's brilliant book, Invite Avatars, genealogy of black women's art and performance. An examination of Black performance art, objecthood, and avatars staged by Black women artists, which is part of the NYU cultural, Sexual Culture Series, edited by the late and amazing Belay Williams. His first book is already splitting heads. Robin D.G. Kelly explains that embodied avatars radically disrupts prevailing histories, definitions, and genealogies of performance art by focusing on Black women who, over the course of two centuries, sought to turn their degraded bodies into dissident tools of emancipation and social critique. Recognizing the first modern stage of black woman formativity as the auction block, Yuri Millen reveals how black women turn education into objecthood, enabling them to remake, disguise, remold the self into an object of resistance, an embodied nightmare to the American dream. Full of eye popping analytical turns and thrilling theoretical, theoretical high wire acts, this book is both brilliant scholarship and performance to be reckoned with. And I agree completely with it. Besides the body avatars, Professor Millen has published articles on performance art, digital media, hip hop, photography, and 19th century performance cultures in varied arenas such as Women in Performance, the Journal of Theorist History. Souls, a critical journey of black politics, culture, and society, and GLQ, a journal of gay and lesbian studies. In addition, he has lectured throughout the nation at art museums, including MoMA PSA, MoMA PS, PS1 and the Hammer Museum, and published numerous essays on black contemporary art for the Studio Museum of Harlem. His work has been rewarded by the Ford Foundation as well as the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Today, he will deliver a talk drawn from his new work entitled Surface Sensation Form Disco, Grace Jones, and the Expressive Black Body. It's my honor to introduce Professor Yuri Miller. Okay. 
Okay. Part one, being otherwise. Jamaican-American fashion model, singer, and actor Grace Jones first emerged as a sought after model. Signed to Wilhelmina Models in New York, her first modeling gig at before and after the Black American magazine Essence. Her career took off after moving to Paris in 1970, where she lived with aspiring actor, aspiring model Jerry Hall, and aspiring actress Jessica Lange. In her words, quote, I went to Paris and in three months I was on four covers. My timing was just right. I went there and everyone went. We found her, Joseph and Baker. They went wide. Living with the fashion jet set an ambition to Holland Lane and the models of Pat Cleveland and Ava Chen, as well as artist and fashion illustrator Antonia Lopez, Joan was able to quickly gain working relationships with key figures in the industry. She worked for instance with several famed photographers in Paris, including Helmut Newton and Guy Bourdin, appeared on the covers of Ellen Vogue, and worked closely with several prominent fashion designers, uh, including Yves Saint Laurent, Kenzo Ducata, and Azadine Alai Sinhir. The quote Andre Leon Talley in October 1984 interview he and Andy Warhol did with Jones and Warhol's in the magazine. Um, um, with an indefatigable style and a gift visual and originality, the clergyman's daughter was converted into Parisian synchronon of sophistication. Her career as a singer, meanwhile, coalesced in the late 1970s, stoked in her adventures lip singing on tabletops at famed Parisian gay club, Club Step, and later the debuting a single, I Need a Man, at 12 West, a members only gay disco in New York City. She released a rapid fire trio of disco drenched albums for Ivy Records, um, Portfolio in 1977, Fame in 1978, and Views in 1979. All three albums were produced by Tom Moulton, the originator of the remix to 12 inch single and Breakdown. By January 1978, these musical endeavors and her live performances, including her notorious New Year's Eve performance at Studio 54 in 1977, emerging out of the head of a giant cobra, gained the attention of American Vogue. <laughs> um, Vogue placed her in its feature of People Are Talking About People, and their words, Grace Jones is, quote, a Jamaica born, US raised, Paris groomed bombshell, now unleashing her I Need a Man star quality with one night disco extravaganzas that have 60s rock concert power. Coos La Jones, disco is the greatest music to perform to, the audience is so ready for it. Unquote. <laughs> this was followed on the heels of her anti-disco turn, on the heels of the anti-disco turn, by her adroit and successful transition into new wave and reggae and of pop, with yet another trio of albums, this time produced by the Compass Point All-Stars, which included Sly and Roddy. Um, so that was Warm Leather Rep in 1980. Night Clubbing in 1981, which remains her best selling album to date, and Living My Life in 1982. Uh, simultaneously, she became the muse, erstwhile lover, an admitted obsession of French photographer, graphic designer, and video director Jean Mogu. In addition to doing the cover art for Night Clubbing and 1985's Island Life, um, as well as directing the Jones. Um, in a 1985 Citroën CX commercial, Goat featured her in and famously on the cover of his controversial 1981 book, Jungle Fever. Um, which is now a soft, highly sought after collector's item. In both the historian Deborah Willis's words, Jungle Fever is a quote, highly obsessive journal about his feverish love for non white people, especially black American females. In the last of six chapters, Joe deigns Jones a perfect vehicle for his work, the summation of all his previous efforts to mold black women into his aesthetic vision, an impulse that is shamelessly introduced at the book's outset. Quote, they have been made to fit the world as Goad wants it to be. There are stilts for Rodiah, a new ass for Tupi, a crew cut for Grace Jones. He promises these modifications, quote, the extension of the limb, the padding of the flank, a nip here and tuck there, will delight the reader, and suddenly the fantastic people and places of John Paul Goad have become his forever and yours too, unquote. Describing her face as, quote, geometric and designed like an African sculpture, he describes sensing that the flat compositions were not enough to capture Joan's larger-than-life presence. 
Oh, I decided to get involved even deeper, alternating between live shows and black art. In an unexpected way, race has come to obsess me. The result of this was a one man show from 1982, the pastiche of music videos and concert footage of Jones from her tour, which was also nominated for the first ever Grammy for long form music video. New Yorker critic at large, Hilton Owls, in a recent review of Beyonce's Woman A, remarked that, quote, a one man show remains A, if not the model for director, directors who are interested in how to present black female artists. Good was free to reinvent and play the racial stereotypes because he and Jones resisted the standard narrative about the black female body. Jamaican born and American raised, Jones took from black culture and white culture all that she needed to express how she felt about race and gender. Unquote. And Jones herself confirms this sentiment, remarking that, quote, the, unmar the unmoored power that people recognize in the one man show is possibly because I was simply being me, not thinking about the color of my skin or my sex. I was outside race and gender. I considered myself an energy that had not been classified. Unquote. Merging pop performance with a array of influences, including one best world traditions, musical theater, minimalism, Japanese theater, cubism, avant garde film, pop art, and European catwalk. One Man Show presented, again in Jones' own words, the black woman as a weapon. The black woman who felt she could exist anywhere, who would change what it was to be black at will, who did not want to be fixed so she couldn't move through it into different worlds. Unquote. This is but one example of many throughout Jones' career of her staging what it means to paraphrase Christina Sharp to think and imagine blackness otherwise. Um, in short, being Grace Jones being otherwise. Part two, notes on surface. And it's begins with an epigraph. If you want to know all about Andy Warhol, just look at the surface of my paintings and films of me, and there I am, there is nothing behind it, Andy Warhol. In this paper, I ask us to consider other ways of sensing Jamaica for a performer, singer, model, and about art for Hugh Grace Jones, whose singular career as a quote style icon, disco queen, avant garde rocker. Bond Girl, Provocateur, and Sphinx, unquote, has spanned four decades. Surface sensation form builds on both the multidisciplinary analytical methods and focus on visual performing arts materials that began in the body of avatars. Um, in surface and sensation form, I position recent discourses that are at the intersections of surface, skin, aesthetics, and a sensorium in conversation with the work of the iconic 20th century performer Grace Jones. Uh, as well as her key interlocutors, which include uh, Puerto Rico born fashion illustrator uh, Antonio Lopez, who's sitting here, um, visual artist Keith Herring, and photographer um, and Japanese fashion designer Tsumiyaki, who I think is true here. Having this stubborn focus on particular analytics that accrue when analyzing racialized performance styles, such as freedom, coercion, justification, resistance, interiority, or even finite forms of personhood, I attempt to construct an alternative interpretive framework that privileges skin, surface, and sensation as overlooked sites of an expanded sensorium. In doing so, I hope to other, other multi-sensorial optics and continuous pleasures, what was Ron and Bradley recently has termed other sensualities that offer themselves up as techniques of knowing and art performance. I draw on affect and sensation studies, performance studies, critical fashion studies, queer theory, and art history and visual culture to examine forms of surface play, to use Anne Chang's phrase, or other sensuous, liquefied, and elastic performative stages that spill past corporeal certitude or proper modes of racial comportment or belonging. I assert that a conceptual realignment towards these kinetic surface qualities, what I am terming the sense the surface, Reveal skin and surface as pliable and dynamic interfaces. And it enables us, therefore, to look more closely attuned to the questions of audience, meaning making, and gesture that are prompted by the scene of performance. These flirtations with the surface reimagine and undo binaristic modes of thinking that presuppose top delineations between interior and exterior, essence versus covering, a superficial surface, and a fleshy and visible depth. In that way, I seek to emphasize sensuous forms of knowledge, since, as Laura Marx notes, meaning is produced at the very level of our sensuous perceptions. 
Sensation surface forms attention to the senses, is therefore in alliance with the imperative of one of Stalin's thought the erotic, that readers, quote, read as well as feel, hear as much as see, touch and taste and foresee as well as see, unquote. Since I'm also concerned with delineating, again in her words, alternative orders of knowledge about the body and imagination, as well as new sensorium and ways of being. In short, in Grace Jones, you perceive an uproar of the senses. Thus, one of the queries of this paper is a simple one. What do the various terms towards surface that I briefly left below, whether it's surface reading or other influence that change the skin, offer performance studies and last studies? How does an attention to surface offer us to put Jose Nino's new ways of embodying our relation to the world? And how does this reconfiguration of the senses offer us a partial pivot away from vision and sound, the two most delineated and privileged senses in the West, towards other sensory experiences connected to tactility, taste, and smell, epistemologies that are rooted in the body. In doing so, how might we begin a more embodied perception, recognizing how perception itself is multisensory and thus engages all sense perceptions? In short, how is it that we have failed to see certain things on the surface? The sense of surface, then, I argue, is to reveal fundamental realignments about meaning, embodiment, perception, and the object. In this sense, we may consider, Baker, we may consider Jones' surface play to quote Krista Thompson as, quote, another form of escape, of slipping into and out of surfaces that might both determine, hypervisualize, and visually consume blackness and obscure any sense of interior life. The memoirs that I will never write. <laughs> uh, so this is being with an epigraph. Quote, there is a lot of life in my songs, not this argument. With John Paul, I announced no memoirs, no comment. I decided the only way I would be known from then on was through my music, through pictures, and through art as an art group. It would be the only footprints, the only clues to where I'd been and what I was thinking. So touch me in the picture, whisper in the mask. All you would need to know could be found in how I look in a photograph or captured in a song. The rest is mystery. The title of Grace Jones' memoirs is the autograph of Bob's suggests is a playful contradiction, since they were seemingly never supposed to exist. Listeners of Grace Jones will recognize this epigraph as a rearrangement of lyrics to the song Heart Groupie, the fifth track off of Jones' fifth studio album, The Post is the Night Clubbing, which was released in the spring of 1981. A thorough rated track off an album that is stocked with wildly successful singles, including Pump Full of the Bumper, or I've Never Seen That Face Before the Ortingo, as well as covered versions of songs by Bill Withers and Iggy Pop, the applicable lyrics go as follows. Quote, I'll never write my memoirs, there's nothing in my book, the only way you see an art group being unquote. Love me in a picture, kiss me in a cast, touch me in a sculpture, and whisper in my mask. Do not ask me any questions, my personal life is a bore. Admire me in glory, and art group be that's all. Unquote. The epigraph by way of song lyrics from Frame I'll Never Write My Memoirs suggests, I argue, that while this book is a creation myth of sorts, and is narrated in the traditional as-told-to as -to format like most memoirs, it also desires not to be analyzed in the conventional way that we usually approach memoirs. And while in Vale's secrets, it desires and will keep its mystery. Quote, there are plenty of secrets to reveal and in the mood. This doesn't mean that I have spoiled the mystery, unquote. Jones is quote unquote putting another version forward that happens to also be quote the need that I have made up, where there are other needs that I have not even thought of, but I will get to them. Unquote. And she likens a book's front and back covers to sex, teasing a reader from the outset that quote, if you go under the covers, do not be outraged at what you find, it's your fault for those covers. <laughs> Uh, this, in short, is an instantiation of what I'm arguing of the memoir itself as an art performance. Um, so I'm partially thinking of this through Milana Stalin's recent reconceptualization of sex work as quote-unquote art as experience, and in part to kind of refuse hierarchies that consistently privilege intellectual labor over the actual labor performed by other people, including cultural producers and sex workers. 
One also thinking here with Juan Maria Rodriguez's recent writing of Vanessa Del Rio's narrative, um, our me memoir actually, particularly her claim that is, quote, Del Rio's, quote, insistence on authorizing her own interpretive frame rather than the experiences themselves that pose the greatest challenge to existing feminist formulations of sexual politics, end quote. If Rodriguez continues, we should, quote, wrestle with the ability of speaking subjects to narrate their own complex realities, we also need to listen to these alternative forms of meaning making, leaving room for those moments that actually resist meaning, unquote. Um, and that way we can think of this as a memoir that desires then to be taken up as an interpreted as art. It is a myth-making exercise, one that is plastic and mobile, allowing already shape-shifting artists like Jones to continue more from before our eyes, recognizing that she may, in fact, slip in and out of the memoir, even as it temporarily captures her. But the book makes clear that we should interpret Jones' staging as, stagings as art, and also suggests that it's a document that is being harnessed by Jones herself, um, who thinks of herself as, as she puts in the book, a quote, artist, creature, object. In that way, this text is not just a documentation of Jones' performances. I think, in part, the text itself is a performance. If all I never write my memoirs is in, is in, in itself a sensuous text, this is also in part because the text itself grounds itself in the sensuous geography that is Jamaica, and Jones' exile from it via Syracuse, New York, Philadelphia, Paris, and finally New York City. And Jones, as she suggests, as she suggested that Lamar had to invent herself in order to exist, the multiple chapter headings and drums and locations, whether it be Spanish Town or Paris, made clear her spatial imaginaries were crucial to this inventing of the self. <laughs> Splicing influences across a set of genres and geographic locales in order to create a new self. And I'm also taking here like Nadia Ellis's recent work too, thinking about you know, to be a diaspora is also to be under the influence of multiple, sometimes conflicting influences. Um, so, so, in similar terms, I argue Jones and Lamar reflects a tension then between the sensory visions of the West versus the Nega with the more proximal senses and vocal vocabularies and more value. And this is something that is reconfirmed throughout the Lamar multiple times. So, for instance, um, when Jones is remarking on theatricality that's privileged in Caribbean aesthetic practices, she says, quote, to perform in the Caribbean, you need a certain flourish. This is a place that likes big gestures and a sense of grandeur. Um, and for the former, Jones spends a lot of time describing the lushness of a Jamaica she did not know until she returns later as an adult. Um, this is a place she describes a constant tropic din, intoxicating rums, luxuriant molasses, of a frenzied and swelling lushness, where the sea is always clean on the performance, or with its continual sense of motion, and time seems larger and looser than it does anywhere else. Part four, disciplinary trouble, and then turning the difficulty. So, a part of, um, so okay, this section is basically about, this is more kind of like, I kind of do a read of art history. So, <laughs> here we go. Um, so, most of the work of Grace Jones in art history is about her partnership with Jean Paul, um, even placing Jones in the zone of black aesthetics poses its own problems, since it do so often obscures how Jones also put expectations of what black American sound or book um, sound would look like. So she confirms this in her memoirs numerous times, remarking the quote, I looked black but did not sound black, or at least not black American. I was black but European, European but Jamaican. And perhaps this explains Black American magazine Ebony's infamous declaration in 1979 that, quote, Grace Jones is a question mark followed by an exclamation point. <laughs> After all, as Jones herself notes, quote, I was breaking certain laws about how I was meant to behave and look as a model, a girl, a daughter, an American, a West Indian, a human being. I was black but not black, woman but not woman, American but Jamaican, African but science fiction. Mm -hmm. There is difficulty in Grace Jones' work, but what if we begin to reframe this difficulty, putting the honest less than Jones herself, and rather an ongoing efforts to discipline her? And I'm speaking particularly of efforts to render her compliance in tight off of depth academic disciplines, especially art history. And hold it against me, difficulty in emotion in contemporary art, Jennifer Doyle discusses the limits of criticism, 
arguing that critics often flatten the difficulty of works, particularly when they do not consent to disciplinary structures of art history, i.e. constraint, discipline, detachment, and respectability. This is especially true, Doyle argues, for performances staged after 1960, artists who work on the edges of social spaces of art making, and artists whose works are often received as noisy in its effective registers. How do we work with performances, she asks, with different cultural genealogies, such as those that emerge from clubs or nightlife? For such work, she argues, quote, we must turn to different disciplines to stage a different type of conversation. The viewpoint of art historians and critics is a critical limit, not the work itself, unquote. I rehearse Doyle's arguments here at length because they are util and parsing through the difficulties inherent in analytical approaches to Jones' work as well. They suggest a need for a more interdisciplinary approach by sucking Jones and only to do justice to specific worlds that she emerged from. So, to be frank then, after all, as Jones' multiple genealogies make clear, Jones is not really in our history in part because her origins exceeded. Emerging at the intersections of fashion photography, drama, performance art, and queer nightlife. Ifona Fulani argues that Grace Jones' performances are emerging at three sites European cabaret, the catwalk antics of pop culture, and Jamaican and African diaspora musical and performance traditions. In Jones' own words, her early performance routines united seemingly disparate parts a little bit of kabuki stillness, a warrior slash of drag debauchery, a dash of black humor and shoulders out of gothic fantasy, unquote. Or to put it again in her own words, Grace Jones is, quote, not a singer, not a model, not a dancer, not an actress, not a performance artist, but all of that together and therefore something else. Next part five, corporate Canada. Um, so I'm going to begin with a epigraph, and then I'll get into the video. Quote, I am not declaration, I am pure signal, I transmit, that is about existing in a world where images are the most extreme of realities. My presence, my body, in the cannibal video is distorted, elongated, and cloned. I have moved on, though I am still no age at all. Pure force spreading out to the world as technologies grow. I am a monster, still a rare trouble in beauty, beyond body, still naked. There seems to be nothing in the world outside of me. I am still in my very own space and time. I am still moving as an energy, and perhaps that is what I have become. An energy that belongs in ancient Egypt as much as it belongs inside of a relentless machine. In the milk cooker directed video of a carpet cannibal, we see the surface play at work. Instead of viewing a body that resembles a hard container with the borders around it clearly delineated, we see a body that is in a state of constant mutation, a polymorphous corporality. Skin becomes an endlessly pliable surface rather than a finite one, as we witness a body seemingly without depth, pure surface. In her memoirs, Jones repeatedly uses the phrase surface energy to describe her work, and I would argue that it is, it is the performance strategy that is also employed here in this video. Surface is not an earth, but vibrant, pulsating, and constantly in motion, undulating like a bowl of water. Matter thus offers a texture that is infinitely porous, that is spongy or cavernous about the two parts to quote to lose, an elastic body of curved movements, of folds that threaten but not a but do not obliterate coherence. And in so doing, you perceive a challenge to subjectivity. Instead of an inner outer depth surface, we perceive we get something else, a relay between epidermal certitude and stylistic vicissitude, to quote Yang Chang, a body that is seemingly without organs. The terms of racial legibility are based on, moreover, surface versus interiority, or that which is naked and visible versus that which is veiled and hidden, are also foiled in this video. The body becomes plastic-like, stretchable, and seemingly two-dimensional, nothing, perhaps, but decorative surface. We see the agency of surface to quote Tina Post, its abilities to act, to act of its own accord and on its own behalf. Within the aesthetics of black shininess made lay cultural possibilities for the former like Grace Jones, a constellation of multiple surfaces that is understood as concealing nothing. 
Summer Cannibal invokes then what it means as a viewer to crest the lip of the surface, to be temporarily subsumed by, sensuous, by sensuous surface pleasures. It operates as a jumping off point to consider both the potential pleasures of the surface, to quote him from Musser, which alludes to an economy of contact that operates through a set of unexpected relationalities. So I'm almost done. Maybe one more section, and then we get to conclusion. Um, so this is called Not a Role Model, Problematic Black Performers. In so doing, it might be helpful to reposition Grace Jones alongside her senior counterpart, seen here, model actress Dr. Luna, who in 1966 became the first black woman to win the cover of Vogue, and who acted in films by Warhol and Fellini in the mid to late 1960s. In a genealogy of what the art historian Richard Powell has termed, quote, problematic black women performers. Such women, he argues, are a problem in that their individualistic career choices do not completely align with racial solidarity. They become icons, but not role models. Their racial idiosyncrasy, slashing, sacrosanct notions of identity. This sentiment was echoed again in Jones' interview with Andre Leon Talley and Andy Warhol, and then she flatly rejected the role of a role model. Both in general, they don't think of me as a role, they think of me as a role model, but I don't, and specifically for black women, quote, no, I do not think in color. If both women share an orthodox black identity and unconventional approach to modeling, Luna, for instance, for a brief time, don't block blue contact lenses, and both repeatedly display um, nudity, as seen here, and their respective Playboy spreads, they also converge at striking points. Both have a rapport with image makers, again, mostly white male photographers and artists. Uh, both share an adroit pivot between modeling, acting, and fine art portraiture, um, going back to here. Um, both have a cognizance of the relationship between European culture and women of African descent, both identifying Josephine Baker as an idol. And most especially, both have a shared performance of what Powell calls ocular assault and their opposition to conventional art forms. This is perhaps most striking with Luna and her most famous photograph seen on the right of her miming the photographic lens with her fingertips, whereas with Jones, it's perhaps most evident in her work in Jungle Fever. It's perhaps for this reason that both women share the patronage of Andy Warhol. We featured Luna and Spring Test on Young Luna in 1964 and Camp in 1965. The latter hinted at how notions of Camp and Warhol's we were partly indebted to Luna, or at least could be adroitly mined by her. Indeed, both women were highly aestheticized. Time magazine published an article in April 1966 called The Luna Year, in which it described six foot two Luna as a new heavenly body because of her striking singularity, promises to remain on high for many a season, while Jean-Paul described Jones in Jungle Fever as, quote, not just a pretty model, but a fresh image, a demigoddess, black and shiny, who offers a whole new sensibility, which is far more interesting to me than just the ability to sing properly, unquote. Frustrating national frameworks in our global travels, Jones, for instance, spent a time in France in the early 1970s, where Luna eventually settled in Italy, Pairing both women together also troubles a stubborn focus on another historical pair, Sergeant Bartman on the one hand and Josephine Baker on the other, that art historian Judith Wilson frustratingly identified as, quote, the twin poles of visual theory about the black female body until now. <laughs> Opening up the frame still further may also put Jones and Luna in dialogue with other impossible black female divas, such as Diana Ross, Bertha Kitt, and Miss Simone. In short, let us consider Joan's singular iconoclasm and striking angularity by also recognizing her and Luna as part of a tradition of black female performers who render themselves strange and alienating to audiences in their particular vocal, sartorial, and dramaturgical shifts. To begin closing, I suggest that a more rigorous reading of Joan's ostensible nakedness might pro prompt other ways to engage her and what it reveals and also what it obscures. In other words, if Jones theatricalized nakedness as we conceive as a bodily canvas, a second skin, we get close to the surface of Jones' body rather than the body of Jones, a body that does not necessarily offer itself as that 
or flesh, but stimulating supple and sexy surface, which is even seen here um, in this photograph that Warhol took of her. Is surface Amber Musser asked about nudity and being stripped down, or is it about shine and glamour? For Grace Jones, it seems to operate as both, often simultaneously. My focus on surface is in dialogue with our historian Krista Thompson's recent discussion of surface aesthetics and contemporary Alfred diaspora in her book Shine. Contemporary representational practices reveal how Afro diasporic subjects are merging prosthetically with video and photographic media, becoming, in her words, part technology and part flesh, organic and inorganic, subjects that are partially revealed and concealed with multiple skins, surfaces, and screens. End quote. It is for this reason, Thompson remarks, that both the surface of the surface, the effect of light reflecting on the surfaces, has now become the new representational space for figuring black subjects. End quote. If, as Thompson argues, these performance practices stage new modes of representation, especially since the actual photograph itself is beside the point, is the act of staging that counts, then the surface becomes a strategy of representation one that is not predicated on revealing truth, authenticity, or realness, but something that is much more ambivalent and mobile than certain. Similarly, perhaps the surface is where and how to sense Jones. The synthetic, the stylized, the superficial, and as linked to other sensuous surfaces, this leather, fur, the shimmer, purple eyeshadow, rather than reliably organic and are authentic. Glitter, after all, as absolutely Healy has recently argued, seemingly resists an analysis due to its own inconsequential and throwaway nature, has not only on the surface, but it too can signify forms of death that have hitherto been unexplored. Meaning may circulate and be embedded then in ways that may accrue opaque to others. Thus Jones lyric from her song Private Light, I am very superficial, I hate all things official, may function less as a platitude and more as a methodological reorientation. Sensing the surface rather than searching for the interior light paradoxically may inch us closer to the mysteries of the black performer, but perhaps it may not. After all, again, as one of Maria Rodriguez cautions, we should resist the urge to place meaning in places that may resist reason and or intelligibility. Perhaps surface itself is meaning making. Perhaps it means in itself, to quote Lord Marx. Or as Jones herself put it in her recent rendition of, rendition of Amazing Grace, Sensing the surface may enable us to begin sensing the shenanigans of a quote, the wretch, the little devil, like me. Thank you. Um, please, the floor is open for questions. Take it in. Hi, thank you for that really great talk. Um, and I really like the way you were pushing against disciplinary boundaries, not just in art history, but also in in African American studies and in black studies. Um, and I was going to bring up your your other disciplinary poem, English, right? Um, because the way you're reading surface also rubs against sort of this this move towards surface reading mm -hmm. that's very controversial in that field, which is sort of very interesting pitted against art history or um, anything that deals with vision in general, right, and, and the surface. So I was just curious, um, as that's part of the discipline, even though this work is cultural studies, uh, uh, sort of more squarely, where where you sort of see that disciplinary boundary that you're pushing um, with this reading as well. No, it's a great question. Of course, it's a question that keeps getting asked. So yeah. like, <laughs> at some point, like I had to start reading a certain stuff. Yes. People kind of asked me about it. I was yeah. like, let me just go see what this is actually about. So I mean, you know, I, mean, I quote some of them because some of the stuff I do find really interesting yeah. because some of the stuff that people are to to argue is very similar to some of the stuff that I'm thinking about too. Mm -hmm. So I do like this idea of um, you know exploding the kind of like inner outer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, depth kind of versus surface. I find that really stimulating, but I find that people who do surface reading, it seems to be, I mean, to be really frank, it seems to be just a really closed, esoteric conversation. Oh, yeah. You know, and I find that what's interesting is 
Surface has shown up as a key word across multiple disciplines right now, but people who do surface reading do not seem to be interested in those other types of conversations. Um, so it's a popular that surface reading becomes a strictly literary strategy that ironically I think is taking cues from aesthetics, but doesn't want to seem to privilege aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be this way that surface reading does not talk about embodiment and definitely does not talk about race. You know, it doesn't want to talk about aesthetics at all in ways that I find really problematic. Um, so many ways, what I started figuring out as people were starting to ask me about that, I was like, oh, this paper is actually about surface aesthetics. And I think what I'm trying to make an argument for is that what surface aesthetics is really something different than surface reading is. Um, in part because I think surface aesthetics has to think about art, obviously, but I think it's also, I think, you know, bringing Krista Thompson and other people. You know, there's people in black studies who are kind of the intersection of black studies and art history who are doing really interesting things with surface that people who do surface reading are just not interested in at all. You know, and I think that's just a conversation that I think um, needs to be exploded outward a little bit. So I think it's partly that, and I think it's also there, as you know, is a real suspicion of the visual in English departments, right? So I think there's a real way that like visual art in particular um, it's something that people, literary critics, are really suspect of. It's maybe the reason why we don't want to think about it in terms of surface reading. Um, yeah, so I think that's one way to kind of think about that. So yeah, I'm interested in, again, like the questions that they're asking, but I'm interested in using different objects to get at those questions. Because I think, you know, like the only text that's really in here is like no more, no more. And even then, you know, I think, like people have asked me, oh, are you doing a surface reading of her text? And I was like, I don't know if I would argue that's what it is. I mean, I think it's doing interesting things with surface. But I wouldn't want to place this in the canon of surface readings. I think there's a way, particularly in English right now, that has just taken over the whole conversation. So. Uh, what are your thoughts on the present day objectification of black female artists? That's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Is there someone you're thinking about? Uh, that's yes. Uh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, Beyonce's Lemonade, like, that was a very political, you know, series of videos, so mm -hmm. she was saying a lot there, but, you know, how would this relate back to Grace Jones? I just think we have to have a more complicated discussion about objectification. I think the minute that word gets used with black artists, it becomes a way to shut the conversation down. Um, so what I thought about interesting about Grace Jones is that from the very beginning, she's been using objectification in really interesting and innovative ways. And there's a way that that gets shut down in part because the minute you say the word objectification, it becomes, mm -hmm. oh, like, Jean-Paul made Grace Jones do those things. Yeah. And that's like, that's his, um, so the images that we see of her, some of the ones that I showed in the presentation, like that's John Hall. And, you know, there's a way, what we're trying to say, there's a way that I think Black Studies has not taken up Grace Jones, probably precisely because of that question. So there's a way that in which, like, what she's doing, objectifying her own body, people in Black Studies, I think, find really problematic. And I think also the question of politics, right? So there's a way that I think, it's not a surprise that someone like Nina Simone is a much more popular subject for Black Studies right now than someone like Chris Jones. In part because I think if you do performance practices that cannot be easily read as political in very particular ways, there's a way that you can actually get left as a subject of a kind of report. Uh, so I think in some ways that's part of the reason why I think that she's been in Black for a really long time. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think like objectification. I mean, I argue this in a book, I don't know why people have had such a hard time conceptualizing. It's like, you know, what if objectification actually is a strategy of representation? What if it actually is a strategy that who people use in performance practices? And I think in particular, like, black women have been using objectification for a really long time um, as a strategy. Uh, so I think, again, there's a way we have to kind of reframe the way we talk about objectification. So I think it just becomes a way. Um, it just becomes a way to make a conversation that could be really complicated, really simplistic. Because then it really assumes certain things about agency um, and power that I think people like Grace Jones are really trying to complicate. Um, so I think, you know, what does it mean to actually work at the very limits of those things? Or even like, you know, objection, like, you know, queer theory is talking a lot about, like, you know, race and objection right now. 
And I think race jokes is another example of this. Like, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean to take pleasure in your own objection? Like, that might be a kind of way to frame this. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of dovetail off of that question about the objectification uh, aspect. Um, does everybody know how old Jake Grace Jones is? Uh -huh. You're asking me? No, no, I, well, I'm sort of pretty much, it's sort of like a room question for the room. Everybody knows how old Grace Jones is currently, right? Yeah. So, unless and until you're like at that age or around that age, will you truly understand like what it was for her to walk in the room and be who she was at the time when she was? Because when she came into the public life, especially in the U.S. I was in college, or just about to go into college. So for a lot of black women at that time, and the, um, especially in the, the early to mid-70s, she, that question mark followed by explanation point that mentioned in Ebony, was a valid um, sort of response to her, because no one had seen anyone like Grace Jones publicly. We saw her in our community. We saw her in the side of our bill, but we didn't see her publicly in especially the music industry or the entertainment world, um, in definitely fashion. Um, and so when you talk about objectification, from what perspective are we questioning or thinking about objectification? Because for the most part, a black woman at that time with her aesthetic wasn't necessarily, and probably more likely from her mind, not an objectification unless she intentionally said so. But we're all objectified the moment we walk into a room or setting um, because we either don't fit some kind of mold or model or we or suit that mold or model or thought to an extreme. So my I guess my Coming with me to when you ask a question about objectification or even racism or some other ism about black people and specifically black women, you have to think about and consider what perspective you're asking that question from. Because as an older black woman, I, in, in relationship to let's say Beyonce, uh, I don't think she and Grace Jones would be in the room ever together in your life. Well, I think it also goes again like, back to the question of like role model. Right? Like, part of the reason I cut that in there is I think, you know, at least I'm interested in this interview too. You know, TJ UCLA right now, it's like Beyonce has taken like all the gravity in the room. So she is the only person students want to talk about these days. You know, so there's a way that it's interesting. I've seen this with teaching repeatedly. You know, like the minute her name kicks off, there's always this way that um, undergraduate students on my campus just want to use Beyonce for everything. Like she is like the part of bar for every discourse there is to think about. Um, so in some ways, I think in some ways it's also Partly about the, like aligning the politics in a particular way, and also like you know like Grace Jones. I think is more like Rihanna in this sense. Like Rihanna is great, but like I am not a role model. I do not aspire to be a role model. Like you can put that on me, but that's not what I want. I think you know Grace Jones. I think is doing something really similar, where it's like you know I think a lot of it's about the self, like creating a space for herself. Um, you know, I think like you know like modeling is objectification to some degree too, and I think what Jones talks about is even for her to be a model in that particular time period was like extremely um, transgressive. You know, like to be someone who like doesn't have like long flowing hair, does not light skin, most of which she does. I think was a really big challenge to very conventional notions of beauty. You know, so I think that's also something else that she was doing. I wonder if you could talk, I mean, maybe this is tied a little bit into um, both service reading and objectification and self objectification. If you could really talk a little more about her darkness um, and how that, in fact, I mean, it's interesting that critiques of Grace Jones are like, 
she's a white man's puppet, or whatever, but that she, <laughs> but that she's actually, actually rejected inside of sort of more normative black aesthetics. And so I wonder if you could talk about, I was just like in love with like this idea of her, her skin, and surface So I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about how her darkness played out in terms of um, surface reading and gentrification. <coughs> Wow, that's a great question. Um, I have to think more about that. There's other places I've cut in the paper that talk more about this. Um, I kind of about. Yeah, I, mean, I think there is a way that when I read the memoirs, this is something that came up multiple times, uh, particularly just talking about the 70s and the 80s. There is a real way that, to be frank, she talks about the way that she actually gets excluded from certain circles of black celebrities because of her color. Mm -hmm. uh, because in some ways there's a way that black Americans do not want to be associated with Jones, in part, I think, because to be associated with her, in a weird way, also be, to be associated with her, her skin color. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think there is this way where I think, um, I have to think more about it, but I think there's a particular way that that actually is the reason why a lot of black Americans in her time period did not want to be associated with her. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's used, it's not said more brightly, but I think it's a way that it's like, not only that, but also like her association with white men, particularly like, you know, white men as lovers, but also like white gay men as collaborators. Mm -hmm. I think both of those things put together. Um, it's a real reason why. Because then, for instance, I think she talks about um, Fancy Their Essence magazine or Jeff magazine purposely telling her they do not want her to cover because of both of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, no, you are someone who basically, like, to be frank, like, like you fuck with white men and you also don't have the particular set that you want. So both of those reasons are like, you don't want to in the car. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a way that I think, what she talked about, you know, I think in many ways, like, it was very hurtful for her, you know, and I think it's something that people don't really think about, per se. Mm -hmm. Especially now that she's been taken up in a really particular way. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting that all of a sudden, like, the Grace Jones is like a headliner at AfroCon. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a real way that she's always been an icon, but is suddenly becoming an icon for black people in a particular way that she hasn't been before that I find really interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think it's partly that. But I remember you there's an episode of, um, what's the problematic prison show? <laughs> <laughs> There's a joke made. Um, the character who does makeup and hair. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a scene in the episode of that where like she's talking about using makeup tones or something, and she actually uses Grace Jones to make a joke about skin color. It's like, oh, you know, like does this tone match my skin? You know, I don't want to be like Grace Jones black or something. It's like, I think even then, you know, it's almost like. There is a shorthand way that I think like black folks use Grace Jones oh, yeah. to signify darkness all the time, whether yeah. we actually admit it or not. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, Gary, I love this talk. It's so exciting. Um, I really um I'm listening to what you're saying about um, thinking about surface as a strategy for representation. And um, really just kind of going with the idea of what, what's possible when we uh, try to when we stop trying to pin someone down. And, um, but I was also thinking as a fan um, of Grace Jones' music that I'm um, thinking about okay, this diffused sort of surface, kind of, right? But when I think about the content of her songs, I know some of them are a bit camp, but a lot of them are about love, you know, unlimited capacity of love, or I love you to life instead of like I love you to death. Do you find any sort of like, this discussion, you know, some resonance between kind of your work in circus, but also, you know, what her music is about. That's a great question. I've never asked that before. Um, the first thing I would say in some ways is not the matter of lyrics per se, but that's something to think more about and more about her voice and the way that I think her voice becomes surface mm -hmm. in a particular way. So I'll say more about that. I think particularly because with black women singers, there's a very particular characterization. So if you're a black woman singer, you know, and she talks about this in the memoirs, there's a way that like, 
you know, if you're not a Shaka Khan or a Diana Ross or one of these like soulful black women singers you can belt out, then you're not actually seen as being a proper black female singer. So she talks about the way that actually in some ways, she had to come to terms with the fact she's like, you know, I'm not somebody who's going to belt out something. I'm also someone who has like an unusually deep voice for a woman. So that means I'm, like, I'm gonna have to like have a different operation. I would have a different orientation to music than somebody who does have that voice. So in some ways, I think there was listening to nightclubbing in a way that, like, you know, not all the album, but some of those tracks, like Brace Jones is basically like talking over a track as opposed to singing it. You know, and I thought about that. Oh, that's in some ways that kind of surface too. Like it's almost like the song actually doesn't even need her as a singer, but when it does come in, like she actually it's like on the surface of like the rhythms that are kind of under the bit. Does that make sense? Like yeah. in some ways, like right? I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. She's doing something similar. And then with the lyrics, you know, I think that um, Joan's best material, in my opinion, is actually when the lyrics start to match what she's doing visually. So in some ways, like some of these lines that are kind of like really paradoxical, you know, like you know, sounding like looking like a man, um, thinking like a woman, like things like that. But I think actually kind of start to like find some of the stuff she's doing aesthetically. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think also, um, you know, it's tough because I think also like she has had a kind of tumultuous relationship with the music industry. You know, like I think the music industry has actually like not treated her fairly, and so like, I think it's also why she like took a big break from it for a while. Um, but I do think yeah, there are ways we actually can think about. Um, Maybe really like her stuff with like um, the new wave stuff after post disco is actually having like really diverse influences and actually kind of doing some of the work that she's actually doing aesthetically too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just gonna add to that. I think that for first book, so the book is gorgeous, and I'm not talking really much about it, but I just wanted to say that it's a beautiful more often for all of us, and, and how thorough it is, and how um, precise it is in terms of how uh, the perspective has for the subjects. Um, it's obvious, you would be very attentive to them, and that's a very good model. Um, for many of us, you also do this, which you were mentioning before in, in commenting, where you're almost advocating for kind of for kind of conceptual underdogs in a way. So if you think about um, the, in your investment in making us think differently about the object, and what it means to the object, uh, what, it, what objectification can mean in the book, um, it seems to be matched here with a real investment in um, pushing us to take the surface seriously. Um, and that's an interesting kind of meta positioning. I wonder about why that investment in these terms that are maybe so easily dismissed rhetorically, um, why that is. And to think about then a term that is as deep, equally as difficult for me, um, and especially comes up when thinking about Grace Jones, if, so the Avatar also has a kind of spiritual implication, um, which you talk about uh, briefly in, in the book, and the fact that it's kind of this anthropomorphic uh, representation of a kind of like a spirit energy, right? But then also alongside that is the idea of the fetish. Mm -hmm. um, which is a kind of an object that takes on that has a kind of spiritual weight or spiritual value that we in, in view of it. Um, and this fetishization of Grace Jones as a sexual object, as a kind of racial object. Um, and I wonder, is there recuperating? It seems like you're going down that path, but you don't say it. I don't know if it's as it's you say it in public. Um, is it possible to do that kind of recuperative gesture with, this, with the fetish? To think differently about Grace Jones as a fetish and have that mean differently? Um, have to, see something different about the fetish as a kind of object and what that might mean conceptually for us to think about fetishization in general. It could be dangerous, but I wonder if you're willing to, um, to go there. Uh, and just the, the, so the first part is just about the fetish and we're getting to the fetish as good object and as this thing. Um, if you're willing to go there with us and think about the fetish as a good thing, that we'll see the procedure and objectification of the business. The second question is connected to the Nadia Alice bit that you brought up, um, and part of what she's doing in that book is can, can be a, extremely frustrating, she does it really well, um, insistence on reading queerness and Caribbean bodies that aren't same-sex desiring, mm -hmm. or even gender non-conforming. So what it means to read these sort of classic whole Caribbean men as queer figures, um, and you use that as a kind of bridge to talk about, uh, which don't in, in, in some respects, um, but 
I wanted to ask you about her queerness then and use Alice as a kind of bridge to talk about that. Um, are you engaging her not only as a kind of woman, well, as a kind of gender queer, as a kind of uh, androgynous figure and the queerness of that, but what it means to have queer without same sex desire? It seems to be a, pro a proposition Ellis is making for the black queer diaspora concept, one that makes me really nervous. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you are willing to go down that road with Grace Jones too, as a queer figure who may not be. Um, the gender is perhaps a little easier um, because she does all that gender, a lot of gender play, um, and that's probably more in line. But are you willing to see her and other ob other objects as queer without same sex desire? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know I love you. You can talk about it very long. You just gave me a. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> that's <really> good, yes. <laughs> No, that's great. I mean, that's a lot to think about. Um, no, you're right. I mean, the better stuff, I actually don't have it ever because I'm trying to figure out what I want to say about that. But it is making me think through that because, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's actually probably the big reason why Black Studies does not want to talk about her. I think they talk about her and have to think about fascism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in some ways, yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to kind of like, you know, like, the point of, like you said, like the white man's puppet thing, or is a way that I think people really do see her like that. And I think it's been really hard for people to kind of revise thinking about her in very different terms, and actually seeing her as making artistic decisions on her own. And I think in some ways, to be honest, I think that's actually what the memoir is really trying to do, out of all the things it's trying to do. I think there's a real way that it really tries to wrestle with saying, like, look, like, I worked with John Paul, I knew what I was doing, um, I find him problematic, but I still work with him anyway. Like, I have a son with him, but like, you know, so I think there's ways I think the narrative is trying to do that reframing work. Um, but yeah, you're right. I don't know if I would necessarily go all the way over and say, like, we need to think of pressure in a positive way, because I think that's an argument that I feel comfortable with making. But I do think there's a way that um, I'm almost there. Like, mm -hmm. with, like I said, the objectification. And rethinking that, which again goes back to the book, and like thinking like Grace Jones can be seen as kind of practicing object too, you know. And I think in many ways, like Grace Jones probably has more avatars just for her herself, and like you know, all the avatars that are kind of in the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think there's a way that um, that's something I'm thinking about. Um, yeah, the queer question with Nadia Ellis. I mean, I brought up Alice because I do like the way she's kind of like querying diaspora. So that part of her book I actually think is really interesting and kind of putting Caribbean studies and queer theory together. Um, and I really like what she thinks about in terms of, um, I figured out the way she likes this kind of like eccentric identification. It's like, you know, what does it mean for like, you know, Stuart Paul to like really be into like, you know, white female Hollywood icons as an influence. And I think that's really helpful for me with um, Jones, because Jones, of course, has influences that are kind of like all over the place, so people necessarily don't know how to talk about. But now, I hear you definitely about thinking about what does it mean to kind of have queerness without same-sex desire. And I think it's a question that people have thought about in relationship to her, uh, particularly one, because she's, like, she's clearly like a queer icon um, for a lot of people. Um, but I think when you're making me think about the review that I read, um, Barry Waters, who writes for Rolling Stone, like wrote an article about her in Pitchfork, and I think he says something that basically was like, you know, Grace Jones is the queerest, a relatively, she's like the closest to queer, a relatively straight person can get. <laughs> <laughs> Way without queer, without same sex desire. But I am interested though, and thinking about it a little bit differently, because like, what does it mean? What kinds of things does queer studies obscure? So, like, you know, what kind of objects don't get talked about in queer studies? So, I think that's something that I'm thinking about, particularly with someone. I think Jones is another person to think about. You know, I think there's kind of ways that what I do like about Ellis, and I think Jones too, is like pushing queer theory to kind of rethink what counts as, as, as objects of analysis, you know. Um, so I do like the idea of pushing queer theory to kind of think about that. And, I, and again, like I did that with the book too, like I remember, 
I was talking to some people earlier, there's a way, um, you know, Shantae knows this, like, when I would present on Nicki Minaj, I would get <laughs> so much pushback from people. And I think, you know, one of the questions I remember being asked was a very similar question, like, oh, like, what does it mean to write about Nicki Minaj um, when she's not about the queer? You know, which I thought was kind of like a kind of retro kind of question to be asking. Um, you know, no <laughs> shade. I think that, yeah, it is something that I am thinking about. And I again, like, even like, because I was thinking, like, you know, I want to think about gender and theorizing that more. But I even think with Grace Jones, like, I don't know if gender queer is actually the right term for what she's doing. You know, like, I almost think you have to think of a different type of term. You know, so I mean, even like, People describe her as being androgynous, but I think that's not really getting at what she's mm -hmm. doing differently mm -hmm. with gender. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I want to kind of keep thinking through. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I was really struck when you were showing the video of the corporate town hall talking about pure surface and this idea of surfaces always in motion and that being like water. And so I started thinking about waves and I started thinking about sound waves. Person. So these album covers are so interesting that you're showing because in the memoir, I think she was a really far pain to describe it as a collaboration between her and Jean Paul So he's doing this visual aspect that she's bringing the sound aspect in. And um, I was at the show in, in Berkeley in August, maybe you were too, and was just thinking about the ways that these different raising your framework of surfaces were uh, running up against each other. So what happens when these were visual surfaces from up against the, the music, not even just your voice, but the music coming from the musician. Oh, okay. So, wait, you said surfaces from the against. Just, um, well, just uh, thinking about her in the live, the live, we can talk about this versus the live, live versus the performance. So, just her in the live context of physically presenting herself and then singing, and then the music from the musicians. If we're thinking about surfaces and waves, is there a way that? Yeah, we have this question of different surfaces rubbing up against one another, and then what happens when that happens? Friction, yeah. Yeah, that's it. yeah there is like a level of friction for it. Actually, I think that's actually what makes it really interesting, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, when I was putting the images together, there's a way you actually just do a whole work just at all the album covers. Mm -hmm. from her. Like, if you Google her album covers, and I mean, the ones that even aren't actually like albums or singles, like, I just think visually, there is so much to work with. You actually don't even need the music sometimes to think about her work. Um, but one way I am thinking about it is through the senses. So I've been thinking about that through the way, I forget what the theorists I'm using, but um, what happens to think about someone who's actually at the intersections of different senses? So I mean, think about the words like, you know, haptic visuality or like, you know, loud images. Like, what does it mean when you see someone like Grace Jones, you actually have to think about multiple senses at the same time? It is not the way that we usually think about um, people. Um, so when we like write about people, we like to parse out different senses. But I think with her, you actually have to talk about the juncture. Um, because in music, Grace Jones is like, is as visual oriented as it is about the sound, you know? So I think you have to talk about both simultaneously. Um, and I've also kind of been thinking a lot about touch. Um, that's something that I kind of didn't write as much in the section that I did today. But um, I have been thinking about tactility a lot too. So I've been thinking about what it means to, I think there's a lot of reading along this book as well, I'm thinking about. Um, you know, like in black studies, we talk a lot about sound. Like, sound is like the predominant sense that we talk about. And then, you know, in our history of visual culture, it's a lot about the visual, but what ends up happening is like, it becomes so much about either one of those things or all the other senses actually don't get talked about at all. Um, so, in some ways, I've been thinking about with her a lot is partly about that, because I think also because the memoirs are like incredibly sensory, like, especially all those groups of Jamaica. Um, really are a lot about the senses. So I've been thinking about that, um, and also like, you know, reading more of Mark's work in cinema studies too, is going to be to start thinking about this. Uh, and it kind of goes back to your question too, I think also with English, you know, there's a way, like, the senses aren't talked about at all, you know? So in some ways, like, similar to the book, like, you know, what happens when you have a research question that requires you to have to go to different disciplines to find the answers to? And I started thinking about the senses, and I realized, okay, well, 
Cinema studies does a really good job sometimes of talking about the census. So maybe that's actually where I might have to end up going um, to think about that. Yeah, so I've been thinking about that. I think, you know, like friction, shine, glitter um, have been things that I've been thinking about too. Because again, these are things that are seen as really superficial and not having depth to them, and therefore assumed not to have any meaning. Um, so these are things that I've been thinking about. And I guess also friction, but also like different layers. Uh, her performances, like, you know, for instance, you know, with her, like, being topless and having, like, the hieroglyphics written in her body and then having, like, the clothing on top of that. There's, like, a lot of different layers to that, too, that I find really um, interesting. Yeah, so that hopefully answers some of what you're thinking about. I'm just taking a chance to ask a question. Um, I want to ask about um, this phrase that's really hot right now, nasty woman. Um, <laughs> That she is the original nasty woman, you know, and, and, and that's part of what's going on in black public. I think black culture, and I shouldn't say black culture, I think certain parts of black culture that did that had all the well, all the room and all the space. Now it's kind of apple fun that this alternative black you know, space is kind of opening up and now we're just getting her celebrating. But I'm thinking, you know, back to your your new race, which is you know, aging, which also gets dropped out of all this stuff. So what does it mean for her to be an apple pun? You think it in her, in her 70s. You know, the old black woman. <laughs> She's so good. I'm saying, I did it. And all has. But, you know, do we, I don't know how to erase the old. Nothing wrong with old. You know, old is not to be equated ugly or bad or decrepit or anything. But just, but can we celebrate that? Because how rare we get a chance to see a black woman um, who is over, you know, 50. Right, being so, like, you know, being seen in this life. So I want you to think about that and, and what's at the surface. Once the skin starts to sag and to wrinkle, and then the way we, you know, once you kind of move away from that. Um, so I want to think about that and, and, and nastiness. Uh, can you be nasty and old and black and green? Ask for a friend. <laughs> So one thing I'm trying to do, and like one thing kind of on this, is like I'm trying to see her not just as a performance artist, but also like a theorist, right? And I think what's interesting is she's doing really interesting things with time uh, that I, you know, that are almost like very out of futurist, kind of thinking of herself as being kind of outside time, um, being a different, being on multiple time zones at once, you know, referring to herself as being like you know, a four thousand year old sphinx. You know, and I think also in some ways, in terms of taste, you know, I think, I've been thinking about this, there's a way that, like, we still have not caught up to where Grace Jones is, and I'm not sure if we ever are going to. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in some ways that also gets at the time thing, too. Like, you know, what does it mean to be ahead of your time for 40 years? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's something about that. Yeah, in terms of, yeah, respectability, again, I think there's a way, I mean, it's really what you're asking in some ways is about sex also. Like I think like Grace Jones is somebody who has never shied away from basically being like, I like sex, I write about it, I sing songs about it. And I think in some ways it goes back to this kind of respectability politics, right? You know, what does it mean to be a figure who rebels in her own self-identification, who like avowedly has many white male lovers, um, you know, who enjoys sex, like, so I think it's funny, and also, you know, who has a very clear rapport with, like, gay men. And I think all of those things together, I think, are ways that she, are probably out of exact reasons why. Um, she's almost seen as, like, you know, like another, like, you know, this is not the subject you want to touch, you know? So I think there's a way that that's happening, too. But I think even with the Afro pun, I totally agree. I mean, I think, I was at the show she did the Hollywood Bowl this, maybe last year, I don't know. She was performing topless, and she brought her brother on stage. Her brother's a preacher in a mega church in LA. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was like, I told you I was going to make it on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that, yeah, I agree. Like, I think it's, just, it's really innovative to think of what she's doing. I 
in some ways, I think that's at the very end. I start to kind of try to theorize, like, what does nakedness mean? You know, like, what does it mean when, like, you know, an older black woman is theatrical, theatricalizing nakedness in a very particular way that in some ways we just never see? I just wanted to go back to the rejection of Grace Jones and Black Studies. You quoted her as saying she was see race. Um, but I'm just wondering, what if she doesn't even want to be used for the meaning by Black Studies? What if that's not even sort of, like she doesn't see herself as a member of that. Like not just centralized Black Studies, but largely there's like a political sort of undertone to most Black politics. So what does it mean to try to bring somebody back in who might not even be? Agree with that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think in academia, so I'd say it's right that way. It's like, like, I don't know what Grace Jones is going to think. I mean, I would like to have access to her at some point, but I do assume. <laughs> but I do think for her, I think it's less about her and it's less about the protocols of black studies, is the way that I put that. So, like, as someone who, like, is an American Studies slash Black Studies PhD. I'm thinking more about what it means. What does it mean to do the type of work that you know your discipline might not see as being part of the discipline? Is maybe the way I'm trying to think about this. So I'm here, part of the reasons I'm saying that is in part because I think or the things I'm saying in the paper are in part, you know, I kind of want to enlarge what ethnic studies talks about. You know, I think in some ways, you know, it just cannot all be about like politics in a particular way, which means like, you know, we only talk about figures who fit political protocols in very particular ways. So I think in many ways, part of what I'm trying to think about is, um, yeah, like the structures of ethnic studies disciplines that, you know, don't want to approach certain questions and why is it that we don't want to approach these questions. So that's part of the things I'm thinking about. But yeah, I do think there are ways. Um, you're right, I don't know if Grace Jones wants to be recuperated by black studies or like black folks or like, you know, black Americans. I don't know if that's something she's really interested in. I think I'm part of it's because like, it hasn't happened for a really long time. Um, but I do think it would be vital for her to be put in these conversations in part because I do think, you know, even for graduate students, it does challenge like what gets counted as an object of analysis. Um, this is something I didn't really, you know, I talk about, think about that with the book. Um, yeah, like I'm interested in kind of like, I keep being interested, I guess, in figuring this out now, with like figures who are kind of excluded from disciplines and our conversations. Um, so like, you know, people have read like chapter four, and you know, like, how are you going to do that? What's to be a figure who's completely excluded from history because of activism? You know, like, and that's the reason why she gets excluded. And I think with Grace Jones, something very similar is happening, where I think, um, it's almost like she's an object that's being shuttled across all these different disciplines, and each discipline has a reason why we don't want to talk about her. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's something that I've been trying to kind of, um, I've been trying to think through. It's kind of like I just think there's a way that like certain people get rejected a little bit too easily, and I think it's part of the reason why I'm like, okay, black studies, like let's figure out the reasons why we don't want to talk about her before we like dismiss her completely. 